Hello friends, this is Pastor Dave and I am really happy to be here with you today. I have another story for you, it's a little bit longer and while some of the stories that we share are stories about made-up characters in make-believe times and places, today's story is a story that's real. Yes, it's a story uh, about a family and it happened here in America in 1960. That's the year I was born, so that's a long time ago. The story that I have chosen for today is called Freedom on the Menu. And it's a story that helps us to look into a time in our country when people were really separated by the ways that they looked. People with darker skin had to follow different rules than people like me with light skin. It was a very confusing and painful time and we're still talking about it a lot. Freedom on the Menu helps us to look at it through the eyes of an eight-year-old child. Freedom on the Menu was written by Carol Boston Weatherford and the paintings were made by someone whose name is Jerome Lagarigue. I think is how you say it. Listen. Just about every week, Mama and I went shopping downtown. I loved having her all by myself for the afternoon. Whenever it was hot or we got tired, we'd head over to the snack bar in the Five and Dime store. A Five and Dime store is a store that sold a lot of little things and they usually had a, a little lunch counter in them. We would stand as we sipped our Cokes because we were not allowed to sit at the lunch counter. Once I watched a girl swivel a stool as she spooned a banana split. In the empty seat beside her was a purse almost exactly like mine. Can I have a banana split? I begged Mama. Not here, Connie, said Mama. I'll fix you one at home. Won't be the same, I grumbled. All over town, signs told Mama and me where we could and couldn't go. Signs on water fountains, swimming pools, movie theaters, even bathrooms. Everybody I knew obeyed the signs, except my great Aunt Gertie from New York. Once, when she visited me, she drank from a whites-only fountain and said real loud, I never heard of colored water. Have you, Connie? Then she lifted me up so I could take a sip. I looked up from the fountain. Y'all know better than that, a man scolded. I started to say, sorry, mister, but Aunt Gertie just huffed. I'm too old for silly rules. <laughs> it was a real hot day, but the man walked away without taking a drink. I think maybe you can see in the picture there are two water fountains. One of them has a sign that says white, and one has a sign that says colored. And people had to choose which one to drink from. There weren't any signs up in front of the five and dime, but we knew how it was. Most people didn't expect change any time soon, but my daddy thought different. Dr. King is coming to town, he told us one morning. Who's sick, I asked. Oh, he's not that kind of doctor, Connie, daddy laughed. He's a minister who's working to make things better for us, said daddy. So we can go anywhere we please, said Mama. Like the lunch counter, I asked. Yep, said Daddy, and other places too. Later that week, our whole family went to hear Dr. King preach at the college chapel. I didn't really understand all of his speech, but I liked his booming voice. It sounded as if he believed that God was on our side. Every few minutes, Mama said, Amen. 
and when Dr. King sat down, everyone stood and clapped for a long time. Soon after that, my brother and sister joined the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Everyone called it the NAACP. They let me tag along as they went door to door helping people to sign up to vote. I never voted in my life, said a white-haired lady leaning on a cane. Will I get to vote for the president? Yes, ma'am, I said. My brother wants to be president when he's all the way grown. Tell him he's got my vote, she chuckled. And hold on to those big dreams, she said, handing me her voter registration form. Yes, ma'am, I'll tell him, I promised, thinking about my own dreams, too. Times are changing, she said, waving as I left. One day, Mama and I went shopping downtown. We stopped at the snack bar, just like always. I tugged at Mama's sleeves. Look over the lunch counter. We know those boys. There sat four of Brother's friends from A&T College. Do they know they're in the wrong place? I whispered. Some rules have to be broken, Mama whispered back. I heard one of them order. Coffee and a donut, please. I'm sorry. We can't serve your kind, said the blonde-haired waitress, wringing her hands. The boys didn't budge. Don't you all understand English? A kitchen worker asked. Go on over to the snack bar, she hissed. Stop making trouble here. The manager tapped his foot and jutted out his chin. They can sit there forever for all I care, he said, storming out of the store. An old white lady came up to the boys. I'm so proud of you she said clear as a bell so everyone could hear. I wish someone had done this sooner. The waitress kept wiping and re-wiping the counter and refilling the salt and pepper shakers, sugar pourers, and napkin holders. Suddenly the manager came back with a tall policeman. Let's go, Connie, said Mama. The manager shooed us right out of the store and then put up a closed sign in the window. I couldn't wait to tell brother. Why'd your friends do that? I asked. If we can spend money at a store, said brother, it's only fair that we should be able to eat at the store's lunch counter. I guess so, I said. You think it'll work? Sometimes it's important just to try, said daddy, rubbing his chin. The next day, daddy showed me the newspaper. The headline said, Negro students stand up by sitting down. They sat four hours, said Daddy, peering over the newspaper. I'd be too hungry to wait that long, I said. Connie, they didn't really want food, said Daddy. They wanted to be allowed to get it, same as if they were white. They wanted to be treated fairly. By Friday, we heard on the news how hundreds more had joined the sit-ins. The protests are growing, I told Daddy. I'm joining the sit-ins, Brother said, bursting into the room. And I'm going to pick it downtown, said Sister, tomorrow. I want to go too, I said. I'm plenty big enough to hold a sign, and I know I can sit. It's good that you want to help, said Daddy. But Connie, you're still too young for these things. I never get to do anything important, I pounded. You can help us make picket signs, said Sister. That's very important. The next morning I handed Sister my little flag for her to carry. We'll tell you everything when we get home, Brother promised. Turns out I saw the protests on TV. Hundreds of people walked up and down the sidewalks in front of stores, restaurants, and movie theaters. I saw my own sister carrying a picket sign, and there was the back of brother's head at the lunch counter, my own brother. I'm just so proud of them, said Daddy. Me too, I said. I just pray there's no trouble, Mama fretted. 
After a while, I watched the news on TV almost as much as Mama and Daddy. One night, I saw a report on the sit-ins. That doesn't look like downtown, I said. Connie, the sit-ins have spread all over the South, said Daddy. Just then, the phone rang. I answered it. Daddy, it's sister. She got arrested at the lunch counter. She's in jail. Sister, who always got A's in school, who hardly ever got in trouble, who was what Mama called mule stubborn. Daddy raced to the police station, but Sister wouldn't let him get her out of jail. He told me how the students kept chanting, Jail, not bail. Jail, not bail. We can't just leave Sister here with the bad guys, I pleaded. She's made up her mind, Connie, said Mama, wiping a tear. She wants to stay with the other students. In a few days, Sister came home. Promise me you'll stop picketing, I begged. I can't do that, she said, hugging me tightly. Now, instead of shopping downtown, we had to order from the Sears catalog. Mama and I looked through the big, thick catalog together, and she even let me help pick things out, but we both knew it wasn't the same. How long before the sit-ins are over, Mama? I asked. Till folks get what they want, said Mama. That summer, Mama, Daddy, and I finally went downtown, and when we passed Woolworth's, I heard someone shout, They're serving them! Daddy stopped so fast, the brakes screeched, and Mama and I jolted forward. We parked and ran to the lunch counter. There sat the women who worked in the restaurant's kitchen. They were all dressed up fancy and eating egg salad. Whew! I can't even stand the smell of egg salad. But I stood and watched them eat every bite. Looks pretty good, I said. Daddy and I shared the same big grin. The next day, brother, sister, and I made a special trip downtown. Brother wore a suit and tie. We girls wore hats and white gloves. At the lunch counter, I climbed up on a stool next to them. We'll have three hot dogs, three french fries, two coffees, one coke, and one banana split, please, I told that blonde-haired waitress. Brother and sister sipped coffee, and I twisted on my stool while we waited for our meals. Our food, so our food soon arrived. As I ate, the waitress plopped an extra cherry on a mound of whipped cream. She still looked nervous, but she smiled at me. It was the best banana split I ever had. And there's a picture of it. I like this story. Like I said, it's a true story. Here's a picture of those young men waiting at the restaurant for their chance to eat. The rule said that they couldn't eat at that place, and they said this is a bad rule and it needs to be changed. And do you know what? It was. That's an important part for, uh, important thing for us to learn, that we have to pay attention. We need to be attentive to the rules, yes, but we need to make sure the rules that we have are the right ones. I hope that you'll talk with your mom or dad and the people who love you about the ways that you can look to do what's right and help your neighbor. I'm glad we're together today. I'm Pastor Dave. I won't be here tomorrow because it's a church day. But I'll see you on Monday with a new story. Goodbye.